2022 was a rough year for PC ports. Between performance issues and user experience problems, I was almost broken as a reviewer for Digital Foundry. So to start off the year with a fresh new slate, I thought it would be a great time to bring out a manifesto of sorts, the do's and don'ts of a good PC port, to get the information out there about what basic qualities a PC port ought to have. In generating this list of do's and don'ts, I called back on my experience of reviewing hundreds of games over the last four years at Digital Foundry. The list is definitely not exhaustive, as I am trying to focus on the important core aspects here. Some of these things that I mention on the list are also going to be technically rigorous, while others are very low-hanging fruit. But most importantly, all of them are feasible, and I have examples to back them up. So let's get right into it with my first proposition on the list, and that is have no shader compilation stutter. How it is achieved is honestly not too important. Shaders can be compiled with a pre-compilation step, like we see here in Uncharted Legacy of Thieves collection on PC, which makes you wait up to 10 minutes or more on a powerful CPU, and even longer on mid-range ones. Shaders can also be compiled asynchronously in the background on the CPU, utilizing more CPU processing power found in PCs, like we see in the game Star Citizen. A game can also use a combination of pre-compilation and asynchronous compilation, like we see in Spider-Man Remastered. The point is that anything and everything should be done to prep a shader by warming it somehow beforehand before it is being used for display. The shader compilation should never be tied to the frame being currently rendered for display. Games will stutter fiercely for every user, regardless of their hardware, if a shader is set to compile at render time. We never want to see that at Digital Foundry. This item on the list is definitely one that has the most technical rigor and thought that you need to put into it, but it is probably the most important item on this list right now, given the disastrous situation that we have seen as of late in PC ports. One other tip I have here for shader compilation is that if there is going to be a lengthy pre-compilation step and you as a developer are worried about bad user experience while they wait for the compilation to occur, then make it a pre-compilation that is interruptible or optional with a warning that the user will experience stutter if they choose not to wait for the pre-compilation to finish. Modern Warfare 2 does this nicely where you can kind of cancel and recompile shaders on demand with the click of a button. I find that to be great design. Okay, now on to item number two, and that is have visually responsive graphical options. Here I say include graphical settings, menus, or options which allow instantaneous feedback or quick visual feedback. For example, look at a game like Days Gone on PC. I really like this port. This is probably the pinnacle of graphical menu design at the moment and should definitely be emulated. You can change options in the menu while the game world is still being rendered behind that menu. And in the top right hand corner there, it is possible to see the performance impact of what is being changed in real time. I seriously recommend emulating the style of graphical menu. And it is important to have a menu like this or the one found in Spider-Man Remastered, which is also very similar, because it allows the user to see the changes to the presentation in real time so they can see the effect on visuals and performance. Having to go in and out of a menu, or even worse, reload the game after a setting change, makes meaningful setting changes almost impossible. Still, if you cannot have this awesome menu design, like in Days Gone, due to the screen flashing or something like that that you want to avoid, then in its place definitely use descriptive text, visual indicators, and even performance hint as to which PC component is most stressed by the setting being changed. Gears 5 on PC does this, and it gives a great insight to what the graphical options do in that game. A lot of users tend to think that a game's performance is fully limited by what GPU they have in their system, when in reality the CPU and the amount of video memory can be equally if not even more crucial to their getting good performance. Putting hints as to which subcomponent of the PC is most affected by an option like we see in Gears 5 here is very, very useful. Continuing on with the theme of menus, my third item on this list is have sensible convention-driven menu navigation. There have been thousands of PC games over the last 30 years, 
and they have all had menus of some sort. And in that time, a lot of conventions have arisen. Do not break standardized conventions. For example, escape key or backspace should always back you out of a menu page. The arrow keys and even WASD should be usable to navigate a menu without using a mouse at all. Alt plus F4 should always quit the game to the desktop. There are a lot more of these conventions, of course, and you will understand them by playing PC games, but the gist is that users should be able to control the game menu rapidly, either with a mouse or a keyboard, both by their lonesome, and it should use intuitive established controls. That brings me to point four. Do not overly nest graphical menus. By nesting, I mean options within options within options menus. Graphical options, control customization, or other oft-toggled things should be at a max three menus deep, but preferably just one or two. For example, if you want to change the quality of a visual effect like we're seeing here in this game, you should not have to go through the menu option, and then to video options, and then to singular sub pages for each graphical option. Instead, it should be simply going from options to video options and then seeing most, if not all, of the graphical user options there. If possible, also avoid scrolling on menu option screens. Scrolling can be a bit slow and it also hides options from users at times even though they're looking for them. A good example of a non-scrolling menu I've seen is in Arma 3. Arma 3 avoids scrolling by using both the left and right hand sides of the screen and with a smaller text size. This is quite different from the left justified options with large text that we now see in many PC ports. Speaking about graphical options, many of the rest of the points in this video are going to deal with them. And five is have refresh rate and resolution be separate options. The list of resolutions and refresh rates should scan the available list of resolution and refresh rates from Windows itself. All too often I load up a game on PC just to find that the refresh rate is not adjustable in game and a number of resolutions are missing. Furthermore, a user should be able to control the refresh rate and or resolution by applying it either by hitting some apply button or backing out of the menu. Do not automatically apply resolution after the, the option has been changed. For example, like in recent Capcom titles, if you move your mouse off the resolution option in these titles, it changes to the one you last selected automatically, even if you don't want it to. Do not do this. This is an undesirable experience. A good counterexample can be found in Spider-Man Remastered, which does it in a much more logical way. The resolution option is separate, and every single resolution that Windows lists is there. Then there is another option entirely to change the refresh rate of that chosen resolution. The resolution is only applied then when the user wants it to be. Item number six on my list is include a field of view option or FOV option as it is otherwise called. Low field of views often found in console games to create claustrophobic moods or to save on performance can make PC users literally viscerally sick. An FOV option, like we are seeing here in Days Gone's PC port, will make the game actually playable for many users, where the default FOV might have otherwise been much too narrow. Supporting a variable FOV also makes it possible to support number seven on my list, and that is include a variable aspect ratio and variable frame rate. Not every player on PC will be using a standard 16 by nine ratio monitor, that is locked at 60 FPS like console games have. Many will be playing on ultra wide monitors or monitors that can even go up to 240 Hertz or more. Supporting these aspect ratios and refresh rates is giving these users a comfortable experience that they expect from their hardware. But the bigger point here is that PC as a platform has variable hardware and to support PC properly, nothing really should ever be coded to a fixed experience like it is on consoles. Users will want to play games at any frame rate you can imagine, or in any aspect ratio you can imagine. I love playing modern games on a 4x3 CRT monitor, for example. So tying things like game logic to frame rate or the UI to fixed pixel amounts is a categorically bad idea for a PC game. In that same vein, we come to number eight on my list, and that is include one half one third and one fourth vsync options with proper frame pacing. Quite often games can have frame rate limiters, but these frame rate limiters tend to have really bad frame pacing, 
where the average frame rate might be the chosen number, but the frame times making up that frame rate are all over the place, leading to a visually poor experience with poor control consistency. A good example of how to do it correctly is found in Cyberpunk 2077. Here there is a separate frame limiter option for arbitrary frame rate limiting, but then there's also a vSync option, which includes 1 to 1 rate vSync, half refresh rate vSync, third rate vSync, and quarter rate vSync. With such an option, users can get perfect frame pacing if they want when they limit their FPS, and they can do things like play 40 FPS in a 120 Hz container, which is a killer feature for those who are looking for higher frame rates than 30, but want to crank up the settings. Speaking of cranking up those settings, number 9 on my list is include multiple quality levels for heavy effects like ray tracing. Simple on and off switches for heavy features like ray tracing are not enough. Preferably, there should be a low, medium, and high for each RT effect. An example of how not to do it is found in the recent The Witcher 3 Complete Edition on PC. Gorgeous looking ray tracing, but there are only on and off options for the various ray tracing effects. This has led users to making a custom mod even with different presets for the RTX GI featured in the game to reduce its quality further than the one that is available in game so that it can actually run better on lower spec RT capable GPUs. Such a thing should be in the menu and not require a mod as I see it. Similarly, RT effects should also scale high to high end GPUs and for future GPUs. An example of how not to do it can be found in the recent Capcom RE Engine games where the highest setting for ray tracing is bizarrely low quality. What is the best way to actually implement ray tracing options then? Here I once again put forward Spider-Man Remastered. In that game you can control the resolution of the RT effect. You can control the quality of the models in the RT effect. And you can also crucially control the distance and density of the objects being ray traced against, which allows the user to control the effect of ray tracing on their CPU's performance. Being able to control this so-called BVH range and density is crucial in the modern era where CPU speed is not increasing as rapidly as it did in the past. Number 10 on my list is include dynamic resolution as an option if the console versions have it. Dynamic resolution is not impossible on PC. There are many examples of good DRS on PC. Titanfall 2 literally has one of the best dynamic resolution scalers out there, and it is feature complete on PC, just like on consoles. And it is a DX11 game, which means Respawn somehow implemented an incredibly high quality dynamic resolution scheme on PC, even though they had technically less control over available PC resources than a DX12 or Vulcan game could have offered them. If they could do this in DX11 to such a high quality, then there is no good excuse really for a console version of a game to have dynamic res, but the PC version to not have it. This brings me to point 11 on my list. Include HDR and surround sound if the console versions support them. Not every PC is plugged into a standard desktop monitor with the user using headphones. Many people use their PCs with televisions in home theater setups where HDR and surround sound are very prominent. The basic rule is if you're doing a feature on console, do it on PC. Which brings me to my second last item. Include console settings as an option. If the game is on console and has customized console settings to make it run fine there, include an easily identifiable console setting on PC as well. The recent God of War PC port did this really well. There are console settings here that are called original, and the game starts with these settings on by default. This is very smart, as the settings chosen for console versions of games generally offer good enough visual looks for acceptable performance. My optimized setting guides sometimes end up generating near identical settings to those that the console versions are running at. That is why a game should expose these graphical options that console uses in a transparent way. The last point on my list is one that has only cropped up in this last year, but it is also very important, and that is include all vendor variants of image reconstruction. Each GPU vendor has their own image reconstruction technique. NVIDIA has DLSS 2, Intel has XCSS, and AMD has FSR 2. Each of these runs best on their respective hardware, and they all use nearly the same inputs when being plugged into a game engine. 
in the year 2023, it should not be really acceptable that a game launches with support for only one of these reconstruction techniques, but not the others. And I really don't think which GPU vendor is sponsoring games should matter in this decision. There's no good reason to punish those users who did not buy X GPU from X vendor. And with that being said, I've come to the end of my list. This is not an exhaustive list. There are many things I didn't talk about regarding accessibility options or launchers within launchers, which is something I also don't like, but I think I've caught the core points that one should look for when making a PC port. This list might sound like a lot of work, but in reality, it's about giving the same level of attention and care to a PC port of a game that is often afforded to the console versions of games. And in giving a PC version that same level of attention in its own particular way, it will pay dividends and it avoids the PR nightmare that a bad PC version entails. Believe me when I say it, if you treat the PC audience right, they will treat you right. But that is enough from me for now. If you did enjoy this video, hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. If you're already a subscriber, hit that little bell in the corner to be informed as soon as Digital Foundry posts a video. If you want to help us out, support DF on Patreon to get years worth of my content in high quality for download. Other than that, comment below, follow on Twitter, and as always, this is Alex, bring you farewell and frohes Neues.